song came on uh, the playlist of radio, but uh, we passed the road, it said Pioneer Road, you know, it's on the, whatever, wow. that is 17, and you're like, boy, I tell you. So we're going to start, you know, a lot of technology, we set up this uh, new thing where we can uh, broadcast on the minis, uh places we want, so we've got three different Facebook going live now, so we that technology, but it kind of threw things a while ago. I had a want me to uh, sign back into Facebook, and I thought that I had a password. Anyway, it's kind of like a trying to <laughs> get that set up, so we're ready to go. So we got uh, Maria's page and Light the Fire Training Center page and my personal page going all at the same time. So I love the technology, but when it works, it's great. But when it doesn't, it gets kind of nerve wracking. You know what I mean? So this is uh, part four of this uh, series. We'll end tonight, uh, hopefully, on time. Uh, we start from the beginning, and this will be the end. And and so uh, we have a lot of testimonial stories out of even newspaper stuff. In her book, Science and Wonders, has uh, newspaper accounts and stuff. So we'll read those. So Father, I just pray tonight. Those are watching and those are here. But this this the attempt of telling these old stories. Father, that it stirs something within them. They know that, that you are almighty God, Lord, and let it ignite their hearts to really grab a hold of the faith. But we're believing this encouragement will even bring them up higher in their faith, Lord, to believe not only for themselves, but to go out in the great commissioning that all the believers will have signs following them that they can lay hands on the sick and the sick will recover. But we're believing for even a greater, especially in this house, that we'll have raised up a mighty end time army that will not only see people recover, but miracles, instant healings. And so, Father, I just pray this will be an impartation tonight in Jesus' name. So we, of course, uh, if you haven't heard the beginning, you can go back on the Light to Fire Training Center page or Maria's page, we have from one to three, and this will be added to it. And all the stuff she went to went through and so we're going to go to 1914 now in meridian mississippi where she had an outdoor tent meeting there and the beginning of new year's eve night uh, the gospel tent is on the sixth avenue there is at the end of the railroad so she's always you know back then they traveled the railroads which i i'm really surprised when i see you know, how old those trains, you know, how they, when they first came out, those trains, how big they are. I'm just always amazed they had that technology back then, you know. So that's uh, how she traveled in those days. So a lot of times the meetings would be close to where she was. Uh, but this night, the first night, uh, there's 20 people testified are being healed at this meeting. Diseases uh, vary from Bright's disease. I'm not sure what that is. Do I know what Bright's disease was back then? in cancer and the tent was filled nightly and people uh, from the city and as far as 300 miles came to these meetings and this one testimony goes uh, a prominent physician and a surgeon from north west alabama his daughter was unable to walk on account of stiffened knee from rheumatism. i guess that's kind of arthritis i guess i'm not sure yes and after her medical skill had been exhausted, her father testified about her daughter being healed after being prayed for. And when prayed for, almost immediately the crooked limb straightened out and she raised it up, her eyes to heaven. Tears coming down, shouting, I am healed. It is straight and it is straight. Nearly everybody in the tent was in tears. And there was a pretty good crowd that night. So it's a lot of people in tears of, joy seeing what happened before their eyes the doctor was so pleased and testified he wanted all that the lord had for him you know that could be a dangerous thing <laughs> at the night service he was down at the altar seeking his baptism and he got it praise the lord for that so that's in the mississippi star and that testimony you know sometimes they had uh, back then they had some good testimonies they allowed you know the fake news is as we found out going to way back San Francisco, and we won't go down that road, that's where it originated the fake news back in the 1890s, what was it, dear? 1864. It's 1864. Mm -hmm. They, they're the 
first on that fake news trail. But anyway, another one was a Christian evangel. This testimony here as well. We were just beginning in the meeting. The power of God is so manifested that numbers had been healed while sitting in their seats. I like that. And the power of God. We're going to see that again. The presence of God. So heavy that it's not going to have anybody touch them with a coat to breathe on them, our hands. But the presence of God. So the power of God is falling almost on all the people and the sinners being saved in their homes. So this is a scenario like it was back in uh, Harper City where people were being slain in the spirit and saved and miles away from the meetings. Yes, Lord, I can imagine that. So it's one testimony of a person I will be 14 years old in May, and I had them, what the doctors call natural bleeder. I don't know what's a natural bleeder. That doesn't sound natural. <laughs> All my life, and I had had uh, rutism since I was about five years old, and, and she, I think it's a, I'm not sure which gender, but at times it would seem as though I would go to convulsions because of the pain. You might know people like that, the pain so much. I would have to take morphine, aspirin, that's kind of light, compared to cocaine and all these operoids uh, to ease the pain. So there's a lot of pain with that kind of drugs. You know, that's the kind of drugs they use back. So mama heated up irons of brick to put in my bed to try to get me to be able to sleep, you know, to be able to comfort the pain. And sometimes, she couldn't lie down at all. But I went to Sister Edder's meetings in January and she laid her hands on me and praise the Lord, I was healed. Mm. And I had a tooth pull since then and there was no bleeding just like any other person, you know, the, bl the blood of being tooth pulled. And the Lord has saved me and baptized me in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Got the full package there, you know. That's what God's all about. And another testimony, I love these testimonies. Mary from Louisiana, the first night of the meeting, she went to the altar in a backslidden condition. And I know what that's like. To get right with God and to be healed. And, and she testifies, I had a cancer in the stomach for many times. I had so much pain that part of my body that I couldn't even stand to have bed clothes on my stomach. You know, the pressure of the bed clothes. And so she heard about the meetings, but the doctor, and they tried everything, and, and the doctor said, I don't think you can make the 300 mile trip. It might kill you. <laughs> she was dying. Anyway, <laughs> it might kill you if you go there. And he even had cast doubt that you'd even be healed, so you're wasting your time, is what he said. But when I went up on the platform for healing, praise God, I received. Almost instantly, I put my hand on my stomach, no pain. So I pounded my stomach. <laughs> you right, you know? No pain immediately, perfectly healed. Praise the Lord for that. I love these testimonies. And there's many a testimony. There's a big book back here, Signs and Wonders. But that's just a <coughs> diary. And so as you can see on the, on the picture there on the left side, there's uh, Deborah and I got invited to... Uh, to go to Mississippi for the 100 year anniversary and they had the, the place there and we were up on the hill and there was no tent here but the big grounds there uh, is a kind of a rough neighborhood we could see police patrolling around because of that we would walk the neighborhood praying anyway but praise the Lord but got a few pictures I'm going to share with you and share maybe some of the stories and so Anthony which was here with uh, James Nesbitt and uh, he led worship that night. And you can see Becca Greenwood, she was there. And uh, so that was a nice meeting. Uh, Anthony, he just uh, brings the glory. He's with us in the wells, you know, when the glory fell there. And, and so he just, wherever he goes, we just praise the Lord for him. He'll, we'll have them back here sometime at the beginning or some part of the year next year, 21. And so I had a surprise. Uh, Clay Nash found some relatives of mine, and they drove, I think it was four hours. So these three little ones are my, I think how it goes, my cousin's kids. And I got to meet them and pray over them. And 
like a lot of the enemies trying to destroy that family line their dad is an alcoholic and off the rails you know from the lord so i got to pray over them and that's just kind of a nice surprise so i did that before we started and amy there you can see that picture she's a prophetic painter and that's what she saw we have that on our back wall there and there's two other ones with a sword and the whale on the back there that's what she saw prophetically so here's some of the crowd we got to pray before it started somebody with cancer i don't know sometimes you don't hear testimonies afterwards and there we are worshiping there so it's an outside meeting and i just kept captured some of these pictures here i think that the, the black lady i think was from england wasn't she deborah mm-hmm. yeah she came all the way from england yeah. really to be there for the training she's done and she came for this meeting and that's uh a choctaw i think uh indian gal there came to be part of it and you can see just the people being touched by the presence of god and there's Deborah and I, uh, Deborah shared something, I don't even remember what, six years ago, but I started speaking there. I'm just sharing about the, the experience of the uh, 100 year of Maria being there. And uh, I did not realize behind me there was a storm coming. And it was it got darker than this for when I ended. And when I ended, because they told me you need to wrap it up because I need to get the equipment out of there because you know the rain stuff's not good for the electrical equipment but i told anybody who wants prayer to come up you know for their healing or whatever it may be to come forward and i told them we'd pray for them and i remember sharing the scripture about the 10 leopards that came and to be healed of leprosy and jesus told them to go show yourself to the priest and as they went they were healed you don't go to the priest unless you have signs that you are healed. So they're safe as they went. They were healed. Only one came back to thank the Lord for that. But I shared that with them. So for an hour, we prayed for people in the rain, sometimes a heavy rain. So there's a praying for this one guy, and they end up praying for the catcher afterwards. I think I had to share some faith into him or something. That's why I kind of, my hand on my shoulder. On my hip, yeah. And there's Deborah praying and Anthony praying. You can see, and Anthony, they things are getting wet there and dark. So we were praying for people for an hour in the rain. Such a hungry people, and just the power of God. Many got touched. And there's uh, Clay Nash. I don't know if you ever heard of Clay Nash, but he's an apostle over in uh, Arkansas, Tennessee. I think Mississippi, a few other territories. We've got a chance to meet him. But he came and prayed for us before we even started. And, and he, when he went to pray for us, he had a handful of gold on his hand. Wow. And just smeared it on my chest. Gold dust. Or, it was a real heavy load. Just smeared it. It got all rained off. But <laughs> yeah, so we got to do some things with him. He's a... And uh, about to one gal, we got she brought us from the airport there. And let's see where we have here now. Somewhere in my notes, yes, here we go. But that uh, no, I don't have that picture. But this one lady, she got prayed for. When we prayed for her, she sent me a testimony, and she told me that word as you go, you know, that some would be healed, and she's one of them. It says, uh. Hi, dear ones, just had to tell you that God healed me Saturday when you prayed for me at the park in Meridian. I had suffered for years with a terrible eye condition that caused my eyes to burn and hurt all the time, even at night time. And after you prayed for me, and as I turned and leave, I felt it lift, and I got instantly relief. I'm 67 years old, and I had suffered uh, most of those years. In the last uh, few years, it got worse, increasingly worse. No medication would help at all. Often my eyelids would peel like chap lips, and I was under misery most of the time. Just wanted to thank you and Deborah for coming to Mississippi and your prayers for me. Our prayers were with you as you go redigging the wells. 
Mrs. Sue Turner. So praise the Lord for that. Okay, so we're going to go to the next city. Now we got to invite you to go to uh, Atlanta, Georgia. It's also the 100 year anniversary she went there. So this big, this is a Baptist church back then that invited her. So the 100 year anniversary of that and we got uh, flew in there. It's kind of a rough, really, to go there. But uh, it's turned into a bar now. That's a kind of a sad thing that uh, a place that had the power of God like that is a night, nightclub. And this lady had brought us in. Uh, and she had to pay uh, quite a bit of money for a two-hour part in there. And so I'll read a couple testimonies, and I'll share about our time there. But Mr. I think it's a Rusky is the name. I heard of that. From East Georgia. He was healed of a leak of a heart. I guess it's a she, had not been able to lie down for six months and had also suffered from nervous prostration for months. And she got healed instantly. And Ralph from Atlanta, a boy, even 11 years old, was paralyzed in his arm and his hand was drawn up. And he suffered nervous fits and he could not go to school because of the conditions, the nervous condition. He tells how the gladness that that uh, Jesus perfectly healed him, and now he can go to school. <laughs> so you know those drawled up, the withered hand and stuff you see in uh, Jesus' time, how those things got straightened out and healed. Uh, Mrs. Smith from uh, Georgia was deaf and dumb, and after being prayed for her sister, Edward, she could hear the piano. And Mr. Baldwin, from Michigan, right? So last February, I wrote a uh, request in now. Anointed prayer call for a rupture from which I have been suffering greatly. I received a handkerchief and applied it in Jesus' name. And I was, in a, and he healed me instantly of the rupture, and I have not seen or felt it since. Now we're believing, we prayed for somebody in Texas. We just got, haven't got a letter today. We prayed for her. She had, you could see it through her shirt. And we're just believing in Jesus' name. But, yeah. you know, he, we sent his word to heal. And then we, she's holding on to confession of faith. But we're believing, yeah. you know, just like this, the handkerchief was sent. And uh, that's why I anointed some handkerchiefs or cloths tonight for you guys to take with you if you or somebody would need a healing. Another testimony, a little girl who was born deaf and dumb was instantly healed March 11th the evening service. Uh, Maria commanded the deaf and dumb spirit to depart in Jesus' name. Yeah. A lot of those things are spirits. And they can enter in different ways, but the, you call it like it is, we have that authority, a deaf and dumb spirit. Before uh, Maria began to lay hands on the child, she was frightened and began to cry, but when she was healed, she put her arms around Maria's neck and kissed her. The child's father said, we had tried specialists for years, but they could do nothing for her. Hmm. Jesus came. He is a great physician. One day, an elderly man said he had driven 400 miles to get to the meeting. The lower part of his body was paralyzed so that the limbs were lifeless and his arm was withered. It took three men to carry him in to the platform, and when he was told to ride to raise his foot, he made an effort but could not, and he was then told to do so in the name of Jesus. And he tried again, and the foot moved up a little. When he tried again, the limb moved more, and he struggled, and soon got the victory, and in a short time, he was walked off the platform, praising God. You know, she would do this, and I think it's where Smith Wigglesworth watched her, you know, do these commands, and, and sometimes people would say, I can't, and she says, yes, you can do it in Jesus' name, do it. You know, sometimes it would seem uh, kind of harsh, and you know, the story of Smith Wigglesworth, he told the walk.
walk and she fell down and told the people to pick her up again and told her to walk and it was like three or four times and you could hear the he described the crowd going boo you know kind of oh you horrible man and finally they let go of her and she took off so you know you just can't judge <laughs> things but you better have the faith and know what God's telling you to do and about a month later the testimony was sent that his arm was filled in nicely and that he was well so he's able to walk but his arm filled in and so that's kind of a convalesce time process among the miracles in the first Atlanta meetings about 10 mutes who were also born deaf and dumb were healed among them there was a lady who was healed converted at the same time she spoke several words and praised God right away now some of them could just speak right away and others had to be learned and taught so it's kind of interesting how the Lord moves but her whole body became light by the resurrection power and began to dance and go forth and uh, went to play the piano and heard the music for the first time in her life. She was so much affected she began to keep time in music and soon after that she brought a friend who was also deaf and dumb and they were sitting together and the Holy Spirit came upon a minister and spoke in several languages and danced and sang in the Spirit. You know, they're pretty rowdy, the Pentecostals. Uh, the Spirit came upon them. I think sometimes we're quiet in here. Uh, you know, there's definitely order in the service, but uh, I think we need to let loose sometimes. And I believe in Jesus' name, the power of God is going to come. Just like in the olden days. And we're going to not care what people think. So we're going to do it unto the Lord. And we're just going to let go. We're just going to let go. So this is what happened here. And then the dumb spoke in sign language, which is a message to the deaf and dumb woman. And God took on her and brought another friend to the altar. And in a few minutes, she was saved and could talk and hear. And both began praising the Lord and dancing together. And so that's kind of like a, a domino effect. That's what happened here. These ten deaf and dumb mutes. One guy healed, and she, they go bring some others. And there's other times when they brought the whole uh, deaf school, she brought them there and kind of put them out of business. There was no deaf, more deaf and dumb people in the school. Well, amen. And so, you know, and that's, you know, that's what the prophetic word that Smith Wigglesworth gave, that last one is yet to come, that ordinary people like you and I are going to clean out the hospitals and just like this uh, all diseases and, and such and that uh, sick people start coming to church to be healed because they'll hear about it so that's what they're going that's what's going to happen and then as we say time and time again Lord he's a vessel he wants to use us but he's got to clean us up and you know you might say well, I thought well, we've been cleaned up so much already. <laughs> but his lights, you know, the intention of the heart, our motivations, why do we do things? You know, the Lord's doing those things. Praise God. So this is a, it's all the picture of the outside one I had in the flyer there. And the 100-year anniversary, so we got to go there, and I think it was like over $1,000 out of our pocket to go. No, we felt like that was what we were supposed to do. So this is what it would look like back in her day. And they took out that back part with the uh, organs and stuff when we got there, but we got to pray for people and we shared at the hotel. She wanted me to share. <laughs> she wanted me to share about Maria. She gets up for me and says everything I had on my heart to share. It's kind of like, Jesus, what I share now? <laughs> Let it go. But we got into this place, uh, you know, we only had a limited amount of time, got to be there. And as you can see on the left side, we got to go around and pray for Deborah and I and pray for each one there. And before this, I'd back, went by the back where I'm at there and praying in the spirit. I got to a glimpse to see through Maria's eyes of her looking at the people. Wow. And just the 
I was overpowered with the presence and fell back. Debra came over. Is this God or something? I don't know. I thought I was out for the count. I shared with her. It was like I could see her heart, seeing all the people there and their needs. So it's a good experience. So this lady I'm talking there, her last name is Honeytree, I think. I forget her. Nancy Honeytree? Honeytree. She's the one who wrote the Pioneer. She is the writer of that. So what a surprise. And Rick Pino took it with his giftings and stuff. She played acoustic guitar, but I don't think she sung it that night. Oh, she did? Okay. So that's quite an experience. You know, we had Marie a lot of times, as Sharon the last time, she'd go to places, pay her own way, and then believe the Lord for the funds. And a lot of times they had to sleep out in the tents and stuff because they wanted to spend the Lord's money on a hotel because, you know, the expense of the trips and stuff. So this is our experience that we had out of our own pocket. God was faithful. And just right after that, we went to Tucson. Just a couple weeks or so after that, we went to Tucson meeting. I think there was 22 to 25 people there, and we got a, what was it, a $4,000 offer? Yeah. And then we went to another church we scheduled down, I think, in Green Valley. We got another $2,000. So we ended up getting six or $7,000. Wow. So God's faithful, you know. If you have a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had to check my heart, you know, on that, but... I felt that's what the Lord wanted us to do to really dig those wells there in Atlanta. And so God's faithful, you know. A small people you wouldn't even expect. We wouldn't even expect any, any kind of thing like that. But to backtrack, uh, the Meridian, Mississippi meeting, Joan Hunter went there afterwards, and I think uh, Becca had been there a couple times in that uh, place in that field where we showed there. Okay, so we go to the next story. And these aren't very happy stories. So we're going to share a little bit about uh, Samuel Edwards' last days. You know, this is a gift from God, her own story. That she, you know, after Philo the rascal got caught <coughs> committing adultery and put away with divorcement and died nine months later of typhoid fever. Maria was uh, single for ten years and met Mr. Uh, Samuel Edder in one of the places she was at, and they were married in 1902. And we shared the last time that he was uh, had an illness, and they were kind of having to take care of him. And I found out a little more on this story. You know, when he was in, they were in Dallas, Texas. F. F. Bosworth invited them there, and, and I think it's a six-month meeting. And uh, Mr. Edder was he contracted tuberculosis there. Even though all the miraculous healings of people, no doubt, tuberculosis, cancers, all those testimonies you can read there, he, this is where he contracted uh, tuberculosis. So he traveled all over the place. Uh, so we're going to share the last part of his story. So the last three years of his life is, uh, you know, they married, I think, 12 years, but you know, nine years had good years. And, and they went off for a little time period. Uh, just the goodness of the marriage. I think they took a couple, three years off. It was a good thing. I think the Lord let him do that because, you know, the things that she had to go through with seeing everybody dying in her, around her. So the call for labor were so many and urgent so that travel under those unfavorable conditions under, she tells here, 11,000 miles in three years, quoting gospel and three times a day meetings. So they went practically over the United States. Many times Mr. Edder went to the meetings afterwards. She went on to the meetings and she would kiss him goodbye. Didn't know whether she'd find him alive when she returned. Mm -hmm. This is especially true in the meeting in Atlanta from March 8th to May 10th, 1914. As the weather got warmer, he had a desire to go home and rest for a while expecting that God would heal, you know, for long of this. Uh, 
So they reached Indiana. So this time they bought a house in Indiana. Yay! <laughs> and enjoyed a little time, you know. And they're believing for victory. And so, so um, Maria had a great desire to be with him until the very last. Uh, but together, they promised that she would go to Michigan. I can't pronounce what that is. It's P E T O S K E Y. Pulowski. <laughs> Sounds like Pulowski. Pulowski. <laughs> Michigan. Petoski. Yeah. Petoski. Say it again. Petoski. Petoski. Okay. Michigan there and also Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to hold some meetings there. And when the time uh, arrived to leave, he burst forth in strong ex exhortation, urging them all to be brave and courageous and do the Lord's work. For his mind, his coming is mine. And you know, people, I get messages all the time on Maria's page. There's 21,000 people that are following that page. You know, what is their secret? What's what's the secret? Uh, what is the cost? <laughs> Ask what is the cost? Well, the cost she went on when her husband was in a dying state, that's one cost of many. You can look just read the accounts that the cost we all have a cost uh, I think we can figure it out everything everything mm -hmm. so when she went out of the house his last words to his wife were these go forward God speak he trusted that God would spare him until she got back home but felt perfectly resolved to God's will Soon after the meeting in Philadelphia, he showed signs that God would take him on for a long. So when, uh, so when asked whether Marie would stop the work and go home, she said, "No, I must go on until the meeting closes at the end of the month." So it's a month-long meeting, and he was in Indianapolis, and she was in Philadelphia. Can you imagine that? You have three meetings a day and have to think about your husband that you might not see again. So later, his nurse perceived that he was shrinking, sinking rapidly, and the message was sent forth for her to come all at once. She took the fast train immediately. Before she reached his bedside, uh, he had passed to glory. So he died peacefully and happy on the afternoon of Sunday. August 16, 1914. So this is interesting that uh, read these different things that 500 children died of a type of uh, tuberculosis. You know, we shared that story early on. The firstborn, uh, Liz, Lizzie, had a, a light touch of her, but she's almost survived. Praise the Lord, I wouldn't be here. Did I come out of that only daughter that lived? But the picture you show there, that's the uh, only thing I got of Mr. Ed or Samuel Ed is I couldn't find no pictures of him or Rascal, uh, San, or uh, Mr. Woodward. So the thing that she traveled for three years carrying a burden and cares. They were very heavy travel, 11,000 miles, caring for her invalid husband, carrying him from Atlantic to the Pacific. Voting means three times a day in large cities and state, each city a month or more. It says, with all the burdens that connect to the, with the work of the Lord, standing alone many times, caring for my husband day and night, when allowing and adding to all the this sorrow, bereavement of laying my husband to rest in August, while I was in the midst of a large campaign in Philadelphia. He urged me to go forward, do the work to the very last. So after the funeral, she went back to Philadelphia and finished her commitment back to the September 1st part of that. And so this, uh, all this pressure and sorrow and going, you know, a lot of times she goes from 9 o'clock in the morning to midnight. And 
it's got to be a su supernatural thing, but uh, the body kind of wears, yeah. doesn't it, Tommy? <laughs> Being out and around, it's heavy. So passing through this heavy strain and laboring continually, I finally got very weak in my body, and I only kept going for a divine strength. So in Chicago, in 1914, she went back to Chicago. She came down very weak, so she left her home to go in Chicago. And they took her by automobile, believing that God called me that I would pull me up through the meeting, which continued for a month or longer. The Lord sustained me, she says, in a time that I had, I had <coughs> promised and my weakened condition Severe cold turned into pneumonia. And so she was a type, she lived and believed that Jesus was her savior, Jesus was her healer, and so she did not go to doctors. But uh, she came down with pneumonia. Her, cold, her co-workers and her <coughs> friends at once decided to take her away from the meetings to Indianapolis where she could rest, and a skilled medical doctor Mr. Green from Martinsville, Indiana, so those who are watching from Martinsville, that's where I was going to church at, at the time when I left Indiana. And he was a sanitarium, and they had, Martinsville's known for the sanitarium for the healing particles of the mineral springs and such like that. So they had a bunch of them there. But he, he saw her condition, monitor her vitals and stuff that she, very sick. So it, his results came and God got you through this by the power to heal you. You took nothing but air, milk, eggs, and great quantities of prune juice. <laughs> and it passed through you. But it says, uh, this ordinary is fatal to those who are 60, 60% 60 those who are above the age of 70. And so she had uh, a commitment to go to Florida afterwards, uh, so she kept that commitment still weak. And so she went to Tampa, Florida, which we actually got to go in, when was that? Uh, March. March, we did uh, down there in March, so we had a good time <coughs> and down there. So she said, still weak in body, but strong in the spirit, and got enough courage to get to the battlefield again and let God fight powers of darkness through my body. The power of God came down on a 12-year-old girl. Hey, sounds familiar, doesn't it? Shared many times the uh, outpourings of these uh, revivals, just these young children, the power of God come on them and be slain the spirit when they get back up. They would have a word prophesy and they would just be an explosion of God's presence. And that's, a, you can point to a lot of that happening through the young she spoke under inspiration of the Spirit many times a half an hour at a time. The fruit of exhortation through the Spirit of this child always was a rush to the altar. People seeking mercy. But we might need some, some young people to start coming. Don't we almost have one? Almost have one. Did we almost have one? And so this is a picture we went to on site in uh, Tampa, Florida, is in this building in this uh, area here. So we like do what we do. We go there and pray these same places that the Lord would redig those healing wells in Jesus' name. And so there's a, a lady that brought us in. Okay, our next segment. So I'm skipping a lot. There's a lot of stories, but I'm skimming through going forward uh, quite a bit in Signs and Wonders so we can get through tonight and get through done with this series. But we're going to the Tabernacle now. And it was built in 1918. You know, she traveled all around and, and helped establish a lot of churches, Church of God and Assembly of God and a lot of different ones. And I don't think she really stuck to a particular denomination but the denomination claimed her a lot of times, like they did Smith Wigglesworth. And as I shared before, they asked him why he didn't stick with a particular church or denomination. He said, you started out good, 
but the Holy Spirit moved on. I'm going with the Holy Spirit. So that what happens a lot of times is that in the outpouring to revival, the Lord wants to continue moving in the Spirit, and we want to build it our own little tabernacle, you like, and uh, put your hands on the work of God. And you can kind of go on a little bit, but uh, you're not going to have the power like that, and that's what happens a lot of times. So she never had a church of her own, but the Lord led in 1918 for her to start a church and have like a hub, what she said, a hub, so she could have a church be a pastor, I suppose, somewhat. But it's a training center, really, in her language. She trained ministers that come there. Sounds familiar. And so, just when she moved to Indianapolis, was unknown, but it's early 1912. And you know, most of the major decisions Maria made in her lifetime, uh, she would hear from the Lord. And the Lord said to build this at her tabernacle, and she uh, God gave her a vision. Because the tabernacle was built in uh, near the central part of the country, people would be able to come from east, north, south, and west, and they could come and spend time in a good spiritual mission and get established in God. She advertised. And she added, she showed, he showed me that the meeting should be of old time fashion power and where people could get spiritually food, supply their need of their body, souls and body. And throughout her itinerant, itinerant ministry, she would never pressure people to support her ministry as a result, many times offerings were meager and would not meet the expenses. But there's a lot of times, like I said before, that out of her own pockets uh, by faith. She began to build the tabernacle and sent out a request for financial help. So this is the only time she ever for in her life uh, ministry. And the money came in. And it was a, a base, a new base for God's idea that it would uh, prepare the people to go out in all directions of the flames of fire. Believers across the country ought to be willing to support the cause. And the money came in. Isn't that marvelous? So that's uh, what uh, looks like on the left. It's a, a lot bigger structure with that little picture. But the inside you can see, I think it's about 500 people there. We see Maria clearing the, the white dress there. And there's some more pictures. <coughs> so it was uh, May the 19th, 1918. There's the west side of Indianapolis in a quiet place uh, marked for dedication of this tabernacle. And this is during World War One, the ending, winding down of World War One. And a well-known Canadian evangelist, so I won't try to say what his name is, preached uh, one of the messages in the afternoon on the subject, setting the church in order to the degree that the members of the body would feel free to exercise in spiritual gifts. So you see the training type of the training center. Now, Amy Simple McPherson is traveling on the East Coast Crusade in 1918, and her heart's desire on her way back to meet up with the uh, Sister Edda, that was her heart's desire, but she had heard that Indianapolis is shut down because the, the flu and is quarantined off, you know, is that the flu. And so her prayer was that the time she got there that the quarantine would be lifted and the lockdown in the city be lifted. And right before she got there, guess what? It was lifted. So she got to go in and meet and I think uh, it will be a part of the service and and her blessings, Maria's blessings on her and I don't know what impartation she got but there's some sort of blessing imparted but uh, later behind the scenes uh, Maria didn't care too much for Amy's style, she's too theatrical in her presentation but you know that's this yeah, obviously, you can see that Amy had the gifts of healing, and, and she had the mountain, the entertainment mountain, and the, even the government mountain, all these mountains. She's really the pioneer in that, I think. Uh, 
and she wasn't like the old, you know, the old uh, revivalists. So that happens sometimes. So we got to be aware that we don't criticize that what uh, we don't see like the old. So I've seen extremely unfair the tragedy before uh, Maria life ended. She would see another death of her six children. But she has committed, had committed the lives and you know her children to the Lord. But Elizabeth is 60 years old and uh, she died. But Maria thought it was according to the will of God as far as she was concerned for her death. But it was kind of an old style bus, open air bus, as an accident. Uh, a car was swerving recklessly and caused the bus to hit a tree and she fell out. Uh, Lizzie fell out and her back was wrenched and she died three days later. Now in Marvels and Miracles, I saw a little testimony of about her daughter. She started to operate in in her mom's gift. She's ordained and such. And 60 years old, the uh, enemy did not like that line going any further. And it's the enemy that took her out. And so we got to a chance. We wanted to go to the spot to chuck out a word to reclaim, I think, uh, in the bloodline where it got derailed. And so I asked uh, Robert Slaredon if he heard where that accident took place. He said, no, but I use uh, uh, newspaper.com or something like that. And you can put in the year and location. So I knew the year or when she died. And it's like 10 minutes. I had the exact newspaper clipping exactly where the accident took place. And so it was just right around from the tabernacle. She wasn't too far from home. And so we went to that place, Deborah and I, and uh, spiritual mom and dad went there and we got there and you could tell it was a pretty rough neighborhood and so we sat there and prayed. So we went to this tree, it looked like it's been sawed down. It looked like an old tree, it's probably the tree that uh, the wreck happened. So we did, uh, you know, the cleansing of the blood there and the deer. <coughs> so I believe we really dealt with that, but there's a lady sitting there in her rocking chair watching the whole thing, so that goes afterwards explain what we was doing there. <laughs> so we're just believing that uh, things in that family line and there's still, you know, even my son and me trying to destroy but we say it's not going to happen. Amen. Yeah. And so So throughout her ministry, you know, she could always go to Lizzie and, and uh, have somebody stand by her when she had nobody else. But that was past now. And so Lizzie was gone and a victim of a streetcar accident. I think I might have, yeah, there it is. There's the newspaper I was able to find. And so there's the kind of bus that it was. She got thrown out of that kind of a bus there. So she was at her daughter's funeral and bravely stood at the tabernacle pulpit and spoke about the earthly house that will be dissolved and replaced by a permanent body in heaven. Now this time she's pretty weak, and Maria was herself. She would have to be in bed most of the time. And then when it's time to speak, they would put her in a chair, the men would, and carry her. And as soon as her feet hit the platform, the Holy Ghost would come upon her and she would be just like she always was. And then after anointing the lift, they put her in the chair and took her back to her house. Wow. She had a house behind the tabernacle. So she gathered enough strength to be able to preach her daughter's funeral. Many times in her life, uh, she would tell the mourners, we have more thorns and roses than Maria, but always the evangelist heart would make a strong plea for her family members, telling them that she believed God has a purpose for them. It was a call to the family for this reason. Some of the children have thus far not take heed. So she's trying to, I believe, 
see them, you know, use a bad situation to uh, call to the altar that they would take heed and uh, and she would tell them, you know, to summons them to look higher in this and not allow the grief to overtake them, but to keep their eye on Jesus and come up higher. That's what our sermon would be about. So Maria had not been well during the sermon and it wasn't certain whether she'd be able to participate at the grave site. But she reached back like she did and many times when she had the threat of gains and different things, and weary in body, they found enough strength to be able to preach the memorial service at the tabernacle and lower the casket in the grave. And she continued to encourage the family members to have faith in God and to look to heaven and not to the grave. So that's an assurance we know people are right with God. We can have that. Amen. The hope and the joy will see them again. You know, I used to wonder how you can get through uh, somebody's funeral. And I was thinking of that as like uh, two weeks later, I got asked to do a co-worker's funeral. <laughs> Jesus. Because I can get emotional and see people cry, and I can get emotional. And how do you get through that? And I said yes, but uh, back the truck up a little bit. She was uh, in the hospice in her home, my co-worker. And I went to see her, and she already was in a coma. But the Lord told me to, everybody has gone out of the room, told me to speak to her the plan of salvation and share that with her. And then it was a day or two later she passed, and I got asked then to do that. It's like, Lord, I don't know if she's got things right with the Lord or not. And so I had a dream right after I asked that that night, and I saw her sitting in a comfy chair smiling and full of life and her, her sisters and everybody crying she goes tell them I'm alive that's what she told me tell them I'm alive wow. tell them not to cry I'm alive I said what happened she said Jesus came in her <laughs> when I was speaking to her in that coma Jesus came in her room and she received him so when people you don't think can hear you, they can hear you. In their conscience, they can say yes to the Lord. Amen. So there's going to be a lot of people we judge now that we don't think they'll be in heaven because we weren't around perhaps when they died. But I, I believe we're going to be surprised who's there and who's not. Yes. So God is gracious and he always sends people there. And it happened to me with my mom, of course a favorite preacher, Mr. Ridge, Jerry Ridge, I don't know if you're watching, came and talked to her and she was saved a week before she passed the age of 50. Then I took care of my stepdad, her husband, living in the house that I rebuilt my mom's house. And he got in a nursing home and I went there and you can hear that death rattle. And everybody's out of the room or says, now. I asked if he, if he wanted to be saved. He was close to 80, probably. Pretty old, and, you know. Some, he used to be a Baptist years ago. You know, a lot of times they're hard hearted by then. He goes, Yes. He couldn't talk. He didn't have enough breath to talk. I said, Well, repeat after me. And I led him through a prayer, and it was loud and clear. Wow. And he died a week later. And my. Uh, Grandpa's, uh, my grandmother, Lou, her husband uh, died a week after he received. So, you know, it's kind of a pattern there. So that's our hope, for if we don't know, sometimes, you know, that God will give, it, I believe, a chance before you, he knows your end from the beginning. He knows the day and hours appointed once men to die and after that's judgment. His heart is that all would be saved. So, you know, there's a will in that. We have the will to either receive or, or not receive. But just wanted to share that for the hope for some of you that have the ones that are in that position. Jesus. So we're winding down here a little bit. So little did uh, 
Maria Doe at her daughter's grave at Memorial Park Cemetery in Indianapolis. The same friends and many others will return next month for her own funeral. So she died on, went to be with the Lord September 16, 1924 at the age of 80. And I think it's just, she had seen so much and gone through so much and finished well. You know, Robert Slurton talks that she's the, one of the few that finished well. Some got sidetracked and some got derailed and you know, we won't talk about that. I think you can figure that out. But we went up there uh, many times, but the Mar Maria's daughter Lizzie's next to her and uh, Lizzie's husband's there, John Ormsby. So that's my family line I come down and Lizzie I think had eight kids. They all lived, so I'm from one of those branch, Olive. <laughs> her name's Olive from that branch. Well, there's a death certificate that I was able to get. Uh, we went there. You know, they, there's thousands of people go to these grave sites, and I, sh I was asking where her grave site was, and, and they're kind of, oh boy, here we go. And I told her I was related, so they pulled this out and some things they don't give to people, other people to me. We went back, uh, time after that, I gave a Signs and Wonders book and some things, and they were just blessed by that because they see things, you know. And so, when she died, six, uh, so six years, uh, where am I at here? There we go. So after she died, this August uh, bench up, I don't know how to pronounce that, assumed leadership. And uh, he was a financial advisor. That's, there he is. I pronounce that right now. Uh, he would go travel with Maria the last uh, a few years, and he was a financial advisor, and she left him the church, and I think it was $1,000. So he got the inheritance there. And so, not having the gift that she had, he tried for nine years, or 13 years, ended up being, and he was sick towards the end there, and so he just couldn't really reproduce what Maria had, because he, you know, we got to stay in our lane, our gifts and callings, yeah. if you're, you know, you, you can do the administration and the uh, accounting stuff, you're great at that, but try to step into something you're not, and it didn't work out. And so this guy here, Thomas Paino, and he got saved in Maria's uh, meeting in 1919. He was, uh, I think, formerly a Catholic, and they came down and they ended up serving in, uh, for Maria. And then he got to sent out to his own ministry, but he ended up coming back because they needed in 1933. He came back to his own leadership in the church, and he launched a two-week re tent revival. God's power filled the tents, and the sinners cried out for mercy, believing. The believers were filled with the Holy Ghost. This uh, two-week continued for 13 years. So he started in a tent in the parking lot outside of their tabernacle. Every night for 13 years, they had the power of God. And so tragedy came to the Edder tabernacle, and arson burned it down. And there's a picture of uh, what it looked like. And I got word from another distant relative. Uh, I spoke to her on the phone. She, she said the person who burned it down later came and confessed, and they forgave him. And they, <clears throat> they didn't turn him in. They just forgave him. So when this is 1946, when this was burnt, the arson came, burnt, destroyed, completely destroyed the inside. But this is post-World War II America. The government had many restrictions construction in Indianapolis. Church members were only allowed to rebuild in the burnout basement. Isn't that nice? So they tried to have meetings and that, you know. But Thomas decided to take drastic measures and to draft a letter to the President Truman 
asking for a special exemption to finish the church and president truman responded to the city officials listen to this i think it was president truman who was it that got to israel and the statehood back is that true malik 11 48 this is what he says to the officials in indianapolis our churches are the first line of defense see to it that the church has enough material given the material and permits that they need to finish the building that's the president materials and the permits so this is what they end up rebuilding there's the church side by side there's thomas pano senior so that's when they're older on the left side but the ones that are on the banjo on her knee and it got rebuilt in 1946 i believe 47 and then got transferred over to it's hard to see there but that's the what it looks like inside after rebuilt so similar to the over tabernacle this big building there i think the next slide shows the what it looks like and so on the left there that's the book they had uh as we'll progress in this story they end up outgrowing that they built that on the bottom left side there that's they had to add on to the right there and so they outgrew that and end up selling this church i wish i knew it for a dollar to a hispanic group to agree that they would be a part of the assembly of god join assembly of god and they gave them i don't know how many thousand dollars three hundred thousand dollars if you agreed to be assembly of god to re uh, furbish that building and the lord knows <laughs> and so they end up not being a few years after not assembly of god but there were nice people the presence of god that was there and good people so they had a hispanic meeting and then they had a african-american meeting so they shared both of that so praise the lord for that so that's how big it is it's a pretty good sized building so we got to go inside there like i said the presence of god is really strong in that there and i think that says 1946 that plaque yeah. so that's what it looks like so we try to go there a lot of times and maybe to the grave site it's she's not there you know but we'd like to just go there and, and do a videos of and tell her stories from there and so uh, with the building came new name is called west side gospel tabernacle and attendance grew to more than 500 in 1956, Thomas Paino invited his son, Tom Jr., to join the staff. And Tom was a natural leader and administrator in addition to Pentecostal worship. Emphasis was uh, more structure and building around Sunday schools. So it went from 5,000 to 1,000, and they added on an addition I showed you there in that other picture. And then they became the Assemblies of God. So this is a plaque the Hispanic pastor showed me. And that was still in the building. Dedication that they had. And that they had it rebuilt. In that book where you saw the buildings, the Hispanic pastor let us take that back to Indiana. And the next time I came back, we gave it back to him. There was a trust that that's the only booklet I think they had and he showed us this and we prayed over them you know try to have an interpreter that kind of but the presence of God was there so that's good so that's a new building they it's uh, off of 465 in Indianapolis it's called Lakeview Church so like I said it went from five to a thousand and it went uh, more so by this time Thomas Pano Jr. Uh, just found uh, another place the current place there, the new site so he's the one that did that on 15 acres near Rockville Road and then finished at that time before 65 
and talking to him we got to meet up with him they have all kinds of missionary things they had housing for the retirement for the elderly and they do quite a quite a ministry there and this guy on the right there he's 96 just turned 96 and he's still preaching wow. Thomas Paino Jr. Wow. Now when he was a baby, he was dedicated. Maria was alive in 1924. He was born in 1924. Uh, so, uh, and he was a dedicated, Maria dedicated to the Lord. Wow. And so he got to pray over me. Wow. So that's kind of nice. So he took us out to um, uh, Gray's, uh, I think it was a buffet. <laughs> Very nice buffet to pay for, her. and share the stories that he knew, which is very nice. Yeah, I mean, he had a nice big oh, it was like a Cadillac or something, you know, Tommy something big, '96, and that got out of the car. I can hardly keep up with him walking through the buffet. He must be hungry too. <laughs> but it's a blessing. I hope we get to meet up with him again. But he just turned '96. Here two or three weeks ago or so, I don't know. That's a blessing to, about that. And his wife there too, to the right of him. And this couple here, they were in, the, in his, part of his uh, church for the transition, I think, to the bigger place. So it was nice hearing the stories they had. And the tabernacle wasn't actually the new wasn't built on the on the burnt down places. Tabernacles over where we first met. Where we first met in the parking lot, that's where the tabernacle was. We first met. And I prayed for the wells to be reopened on that prayer journey. Eight years ago. Yeah, very nice. So let's uh kind of wind down here with this. So back to you the under your prophecy, as I shared in uh, Chicago Stone Church Revival in 1913, that six month revival, Maria had the month of July, and at the end of the month of July, they were commissioning those to send them out. It was a kind of a nice, as a training center, they would have them watch how the, how the move of the Spirit praying for the sick and such, and then they'd have have them not practicing, I guess, you know, activate them to do, and then they'd be on the platform. There's a couple, 300, they commissioned to go out that day on the July 28th, 1913. And then they start prophesying and the interpretations and different things. But she said, we have not up to the fullness of the former rain, but when the latter rain comes, it will far succeed anything we have seen thus far. You know, that's her word, and and Seymour had the same thing about, and uh, there's a part of him on the other side. At the same time, had that hundred year in the future would be a great move of God. And we ask ourselves, we believe in prophecy. Why hasn't that come to pass? You know, we tried to do Azusa Street now. And, you know. 2013 came and went. You know, I believe, I believe that God is faithful to His Word, but I don't think the people were really ready. You can think back 10 years ago, 7 years ago. I just don't think the hearts are ready for a move that He's going to bring. Manifest present that He's going to bring. He's, it's going to be more of a visitation. It's going to be a habitation. And it's going to be minor than we can even imagine in our earthly bodies. That's why he's doing such, and that's why we labor so much to clean our lives up completely, full surrender, and really get back to what he says we're bought with a price for not our own. Full surrender. And I, you know, I'll be the one to say I still have some areas that I think we all do. But he's going to reveal the intent of our hearts and, and we're going to deal with it. We're going to be cleansed up because he's coming after somebody, a church with no spot or blemish or wrinkle. And say, how can that be? 
It can be because it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He said it will happen. We just have to come in line with that in Jesus' name. So we're about to see. I think, you know, from the 80s, I was sharing with Deborah back in the, we were talking earlier, Tommy, about the charismatic, uh, you know, renewal, especially the 67. I came in the 80s in that. And it's always preparing, equipping, even what I was a part of, equipping. We always knew it was out there somewhere. It's going to be that latter rain, the double portion. And what I shared about cleaning out hospitals under that anointing. But we got to be able to have the image of Jesus in us. We got to have that where the creation's crying to be delivered for the, the manifestations of the sons of God. And we're going to look like what Jesus, in the likeness and the power. And we're going to be in the place where we're going to be operating in the works of Jesus. But he's told, he tells us in Scripture, that, but you're going to do not only those works, you're going to do greater works. And there's going to be miracles that I don't believe that anybody could even believe. And it's going to be double what the book of Acts was. Because he's saving the last end time body, the last army, the church, the bride. He's saving the best for last. He's patient, like it tells in James, talks about that the husband, the farmer, is patient for the, the first fruits, and for the form of the latter rain. He's patient. So, Lord, we just thank you tonight. And, and Father, we just pray for those out there that's gone through a lot of things. But God works all things together, those are the good, those who love God. And this thing we've done have gone through this shutdown and the, it's really I believe the work of the enemy. The COVID didn't come from God, it comes from the devil. Even though that is a, a real virus, I believe it's been accompanied with a spirit of fear and with propaganda to blow things out of to try to shut the church down the Ecclesia, which is a governing body. And this is the year of the pay, which is our Decrees and the breath that comes out to try to muzzle that in the time with these masks. But uh, guess what? We have 10 years of the pay. Yes. So look out. Yes. He hasn't seen nothing yet, the uh, enemy of Jesus. He will have a price to pay now, won't he? He will have hundreds of thousands of Jesuses. Deliverers, healers. So, Father, I just pray you burn in our hearts that uh, we always have the heart of the harvest, uh, no matter what office or what our giftings are. That, Lord, I pray you stir up within us that compassion for the lost once again. And Lord, we want to demonstrate not just with words only, but demonstration of the power of God that confirms your word you said in Mark 16 verse 21 verse 20 that you work with him with signs wanted to confirm your word that you are a living God this was confirms he is a living God he's not some statue that people bow down to with rosary beads he's a living God and he's going to demonstrate that he's going to show what righteousness Righteousness is and righteous judgments, I believe. So, Father, we commit this series, this word to you, that your word and encouragement and the faith believing, and we're believing with those that are sick out there watching, that he sent his word to heal you. So, in Jesus' name, whatever your infirmity is, whatever your ailment is, by the blood of Jesus, Isaiah. 53 talks about his stripes we were healed and through the blood of Jesus we were healed he, he healed the whole man our soul, our body and we are born again our spirit so Father we just declare your word that healing has come to those that latch on to that and those that don't have faith my faith unites 
that you be healed right now in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. So we're going to end with that. I'm going to end the broadcast now in Jesus' name.